Hi, my name is Reggie Williams. Hi, my name is Londe Youssef. And we are the co-founders of Black Film Space. Black Film Space is a grassroots organization dedicated to enhancing the skill sets of black filmmakers and building a community of creatives. We host events such as screenwriting workshops, panels, mixers, and other events that are designed to support black content creators. In our next episode of the Black Film Space podcast, we recap our trip to the New Orleans Film Festival and interview Chaiko Omawale, the director, and Lynn Whitfield, the co-star of the film Solace. We talk to them about the process of making this project during this live Q&A. So we went to the New Orleans Film Festival in October and had a great time. What do you think, Reggie? Yeah, I had an amazing time. This was the first festival that I went to where I wasn't volunteering, and I had an amazing time. Met That's not true. No, you went to Martha's Vineyard? That's true. I went to the festival yes. that Londe's trying to plug herself. Nah. <laughs> no, no, no. I went to I went to support Londe and, and her film Privilege Unhinged at the African American Martha's Vineyard Film Festival. Which but was also good. It was but... also good. But um the New Orleans Film Festival was amazing. Yeah. I mean, I feel like it was a small community of people, so everyone felt very accessible. Like, you can approach anyone, like yeah. executives to, you know, indie, super indie filmmakers, which made me really comfortable and relaxed. Yeah. You know? Yeah. It's a very um, down-to-earth. Yes. It's a very down-to-earth type of festival. Um, everybody's accessible. People are really friendly. Um, lots of people approached approach me just because I was there. Right, right. And, like, you can go into all kinds of screenings as long as it's not sold out. And, you know, no one made a real big fuss about it. I mean, they did have people at the door, you know, checking tickets and stuff like that. But I didn't feel like, oh, man, this is so exclusive. I'm not going to get in. I didn't mm -hmm. feel that way at all, which mm -hmm. I've experienced at other festivals. Yeah. You know? Um, what was your favorite film? If Bill Street Could Talk. Uh, well, I missed that. But my favorite film was the documentary, Mr. Soul. Oh. That was so good. I was trying to get my friend to go to a screening in New York. This film is amazing. Yeah. yeah that I'm actually... going to buy it. I'm going to rent it. I'm going to do whatever I can when it's out. Yeah. Because it's going to come out, I think. It's It's got to stream somewhere. Oh, my God. It's got to stream somewhere. Mr. Soul is an amazing documentary mm -hmm. about... Is his name Elliot Hazlip? I forgot. But yes, Hazlip is the last Hazlip name. Hazlip is the last name. And it's uh he was a choreographer in New York City in the uh late nineteen sixties, sixties, late nineteen sixties. He had no experience producing um T V shows and there was a local T V network in New York City that gave him an opportunity to produce a show and it was all about blackness, blackness, blackness. Yes. Um, it was like intellectual black people talking about what was going on at that time. It was all these at the time they may not have been icons, but they like they are considered icons now, like right. Stevie Wonder, Al Green, um, Patty LaBelle Patty was on LaBelle. the show, Ashford and Simpson. I mean, anybody, any and everybody you could think of that was a soul artist was on that show. And a lot of black artists as well. Like, I love the representation of like dancing, poetry. Um, because typically with like the 1960s and 70s, there's a huge focus on singing, vocalists mm -hmm. and bands. Mm -hmm. But I liked seeing those other versions of artistic expression yeah. from that period that I wasn't really privy to. Like yeah. the last poets were on there, yeah. you know, and they, they were huge at one point. Yeah. James Baldwin was on there. That's right. That's Every, right. Everybody, if you have a chance to see Mr. Soul, please see it. I almost cried, yes. which is it's saying a lot. I almost <laughs> cried from a documentary. Not yeah. a narrative, yeah. a documentary. A I almost cried. Mm -hmm. So go go watch that film. Um, and uh, the parties were insane. <laughs> the parties, there were parties every night. Yes, there were. I don't party like that anymore. But I was out every single night. There were pool <laughs> parties. There were roller skate parties. This is a, also a film that is they're really pushing. To have more women filmmakers. More filmmakers in all underrepresented groups, actually. Women, people of color, black people. LGBTQ. So if you are a black woman <laughs> listening to this, submit your project to the New Orleans Film Festival. I agree. And they will take care of you as well. I know I had, I had a friend who submitted a project and they, they took care of, you know, 
um, her hotel for a little bit. So, oh, wow. That's yeah. great. So Sub- submit your project. It's an Oscar eligible. Yes, it is. Uh, project. Uh, fe- for film it's, festival. It's an Oscar eligible film festival. Um, Shout out to Fallon and Clint. Yes. They were our contacts at New Orleans and they were really accommodating, really flexible, just really kind and easy to, you know, work with. And even leading up to us coming out there, they just were really open to our our, our ideas yeah. um, for what we can contribute to the festival, which I was really grateful for. It was, it was great. Yeah, yeah, and uh, the reception. We didn't we didn't talk about the reception, the black filmmaker reception. Oh yeah, yeah. the thing that we hosted. <laughs> the black filmmaker. <laughs> the black. So we we co-hosted uh, the black filmmaker reception along with this other organization based in New Orleans called the Black Professional. That's right. And uh, it was really cool. A lot of people, there's a lot of filmmakers from New Orleans that are at this festival. So if you want to connect with those yeah. those filmmakers, this is a fe- great festival to go to. So we connected with a lot of those people. And, you know, there's still people reaching out to us now. Yeah. Being like, when you're coming back. Exactly. Um, Lynn Whitfield was hanging out there. It was just it was just a dope. Yeah, like dope we hung experience. out with her at the Ace Hotel. Yeah. That's right. It was, it was, Chico, it was yeah. dope. So. And you don't need to be a co-founder of Black Film Space to meet these people. <laughs> you could just be there. And you know what's funny? I went to an event the other day to network, and half of the people, I want to say half, okay, let me say about a third of the people that I ran into there, I met at New Orleans. Wow. Yeah. Go. Yeah. A lot of New Yorkers, because <laughs> it's right in the middle. New Orleans is right in the middle of New York right. and L.A., so at that festival, you're going to meet filmmakers from L.A., New Orleans and New York for the most part. And it brings in industry connections as well. I mean, it's not like crazy, like, you know, it's not like Tribeca or Sundance, but again, you still feel like you're meeting people from major platforms that are coming and looking for indie talent and are actually in a setting where they're probably more responsive to you because there's not as much, you know, they're not being inundated with like people all up in their face. So they're willing to just talk and interact and, it paid off, mm-hmm. you know, when I came back to New York, you know, a few days ago. I was like, wow, I'm, I'm really glad I went to this festival. Yeah, I'm really glad. I'm going, personally, I'm going to submit my projects to the New Orleans Film Festival. Same. Um, and hopefully we can work with them again because we, we had an overall great experience. Yes. And um, so, yeah, listen up to uh, to this live Q&A with uh, Ch- Chico. Help me with the last name. Omawale. Say it. Omawale. There you go. Chico Omawale <laughs> and Lynn Whitfield. From the film Solace. Hello, everyone. Um, did you enjoy the film? The films? All right, so we're going to do a QA uh, with the filmmakers of Solace and with Slim Whitfield. Come on down. <laughs> that was amazing. I was just talking to someone in the audience, like, there's so many themes covered in this film, it's like endless. Um, So I guess we could start the conversation by you telling us how you conceptualized this and then how you got connected with the legendary Lynn Whitfield. The Lynn Whitfield story is fun. (laughs) Um, So I uh, thank you everybody for coming out to see the film and staying for the Q&A. So essentially I have an eating disorder that I'm in recovery from and I decided that for my first film I was going to do something small and personal and I made a film for my little self, if, like my teenage self, and for other black girls or people who don't see themselves on screen that might be dealing with some of these issues. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. You're welcome. <laughs> and then how did you get connected? So Lynn, so <laughs> we were just at lunch talking about this, but I, um, my mentor is George C. Wolf. He's a theater director and a film director, and I used to assist him. And I was at his house for one of his amazing parties, and Lynn was there. And I just remember there was just something about her eyes at the party that I was just drawn into. <laughs> and I, I, I didn't grow up in America, and Eve's Bayou was the movie that I knew Lynn Whitfield from. And Where I was, did you grow up, by the way? Uh, so I'm Jamaican, and I grew up in, uh, my dad worked for the UN, so I grew up in um, Mozambique. Okay. Thailand, Sierra Leone, Yemen, and then I came to the States at 16. Awesome. Um, and so Ease Bayou was my introduction to Lynn Whitfield, and I loved that movie. And so sitting on a sofa right next to her, you know, I was playing it cool, but, uh, <laughs> but I was like, 
But, but there was also another part of me, like not the fangirl part, but the part that's sort of, as a director, I, like I'm drawn to people and sort of stories that I don't need to know explicitly, but just the energy. And there's something about Lynn that I wrote the part for her. And when I was doing my Kickstarter in 2014, like I had, you know, and the role of Irene will be played by somebody like Lynn Whitfield. Wow, and then, look at that. Yeah, and you know, I had a, a casting director who, used to be, um, actually I lived in New Orleans because I was doing a movie, I was assisting a director here for a movie called So Undercover that Miley Cyrus was in and the casting director of that film, I asked him to help me cast Solace and he didn't do the whole movie but he did tell me to write a letter to Lynn and he passed it to her agent and so I wrote about meeting her and about like writing the role and then Lynn can tell you the rest, but she was extremely generous. Yeah, can you tell us what drew you to this project? So, so um, I read the letter, and she mentioned George C. Wolf, and I really have such respect for him, and she reminded me of when we met at his home, and then I read the script, and I read a script that treated people that I know in a very interesting way, which was unapologetic and um, complex and not gratuitous in any way. And I said, she's got something. She has something special. And I talked to her, and she was so appealing and charming and clear about what she wanted to do. For any of you filmmakers out there, when you know what you want to do, it really helps. <laughs> and when you can be clear, when you talk to people, it really helps. And then she said, and she gets to have a sex scene. And I said, oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to talk to you about that. Because I was like, yes. Was good, wasn't it? Yeah. Um, did, you, did you wrestle with showing, you know, I guess, quote, unquote, elderly black people making What the hell is elderly? I know, I, I, I hesitate. What's wrong with just mature? Okay. Could you <laughs> like, could you all like, uh... I apologize. <laughs> mature black people. Black film like... space, you fail. <laughs> Damn. No, just kidding. <laughs> all good, all good. This is the best Q&A y'all gonna go to, all right? <laughs> no, but seriously, tell Tom. <laughs> Tell me what motivated you to make this love scene because I loved it. So <laughs> as a director, I'm curious, and I'm curious about many things, including sex and... <laughs> we, just, we just came from lunch. We've I've been, never been called elderly. I'm now. so sorry. <laughs> All right, I messed up. It's so fun. No, it's good. <laughs> okay. No, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Go ahead. But um, so I just... Um, yeah, I, you know, I hope that when I'm 40 now, I hope that when I'm 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, if I'm still alive, that I'm having sex. Yes. And I, you know, I'm very open with my parents and talk to them about these things. And I don't know, it literally just came from a place of like, I, that's what I want to see. Like, and for me, I actually wanted more explicit sex throughout the whole film. Mm -hmm. And it just sort of worked out that Glenn and Lynn were sort of more courageous and brave and open to it than the younger actors. Mm, um, wow. Yeah, and uh, you know, we had a whole discussion about this <laughs> earlier today. <laughs> but doesn't he, I know, I wish Glenn was here because I feel like I'm objectifying him. No, but but it was like, awesome, it was you awesome. You know, in the edit room, I was telling Lynn, um, you know, because the, because the way where the scene comes, it's not, you know, in sort of traditional narrative, it's not exactly connected to the plot of soul and what she wants. And so I, I did fight a lot with various editors or like people who were giving me advice about the film who told me that it was gratuitous, it was too much, take it out, doesn't make sense. And for me, you know, it, like at growing as a filmmaker, I had to find the language that sort of would prove or communicate to other people why it was important beyond sex and the black body being exposed, being an important aspect of uh, black liberation in a cinematic context. Because for me, that's what's important. Well, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong here, it seemed like there were parallels between the grandmothers uh, struggling with addiction also. Totally. So, yeah, so maybe this was like a way for her to, you know. I can tell you how I explained it to yeah, the editor. Yeah, totally. Which is essentially, essentially I wanted to contrast, sometimes I speak like a Jamaican, contra contrast, contrast. I wanted, to, I wanted to set up a, a, a contrast between how comfortable Irene was 
with her body and her sexuality and then how sort of inward soul was. Like, yeah. And a lot of times people with eating disorders, mm, I won't say all addictions, but a lot of times with eating disorders, people tend to become, it's called sexually anorexic, where you are compulsively sort of denying your sexuality and your body. And so, I mean, these are like, sort of deeper subtextual levels, yeah. but that's why for me, I cut back and forth between, you know, this couple that's so comfortable, it's explicit, but there's also humor, there's, you know, all these, all these different things, and then you switch to Soul, who's like fiercely like sketching and like, you know, trying to escape, and, and later on in the film when she gets kissed, it freaks her out and, you know, drives her to like eat, but also like restrict, and so that was how I explained why it was important for me to, to show the adults, that's what I'll call them, the adults having sex. <laughs> okay. Um, can you also talk about the production process and what it took to get this done? You know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, because I can talk about it, but I'm curious to hear Lynn's experience. Okay, let's Let me do give it. you a setup first. It's a micro budget film. Okay. So I won't tell you how much we shot it for, but it, the set was extremely chaotic because. Mm because we didn't have very experienced people. So like I was ADing and producing at the same time as directing. Wow. My DP, who's my collaborative partner, Bruce Francis Cole, was also help, shit, this is being recorded, was also, um, <laughs> sorry, was also, um, was also playing AD as well um, and, and helping me in all facets. Like I would pick up Bruce in the, the truck and mm. then we'd drive to set. And then we got like people to donate meals to us. Whole Foods donated meals. Like wow. Lynn had to eat the same food for over and over and was just extremely generous with the chaos on set and showed up. But I'll let her talk about what that was like. Do you enjoy your motorhome? Your private motorhome? My private yeah. motorhome. There was no private motorhome. There was for no her. private motorhome. <laughs> It was like a corner of a room. You did give us a room. I got. I did get you a room. Hair and makeup, but okay. So, this filmmaker is incredible. Her courage is incredible. Thank you. Thank you. Her resourcefulness is. She's amazing that way, and her staying even through the whole process. So. Irene's house was in Ladera Heights, which is a, you know, a, a very, yeah, an a, a African affluent American, African American yeah. community, right? The house we were shooting in, the guy was a hunter, like goes to Africa, and you know, so it was wow. full of taxidermy animals and heads and moose heads and stuff. And, and, you know, people were bringing their own clothes for approval, and uh -huh. you know, I brought a couple of you know velvet robes, and you know, to, and, but people were bringing their own clothes. They were getting food from you know, like donated. It was rough, and Glenn, because <laughs> she said she wanted Glenn, and she'd send an offer to Glenn, but he hadn't agreed. So I called him. I said, Glenn. Come on, let's do it. I mean, it really, it, I, I believe in her. He said, I do too, baby. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, she has something. I said, and, I, and it'll be fun, you know what I mean? And when we're touring, we get to have a love scene, and I think she's really going to let us have fun. Mm. And, you know, you know, because you tend to do the same thing over and over again. And he said, okay. But there were some nights going into 12, and the owners wanted to come back in their home, and, uh, you know, we had knocked something <laughs> over, so we were already in bad standing with Remember the owners the of the house. Remember the smoking incident? The smoking <laughs> incident. Oh, we my God. We weren't allowed to smoke cigarettes, but we weren't smoking. Her character was not smoking real cigarettes. They were fake cigarettes, but they didn't believe us, and I got charged a whole bunch of money because we smoked inside the house. It was like it, all it was a mess, But, I mean, it was rough. <laughs> mm. And Glenn was sitting there a few <laughs> nights like, what the did you get us into? <laughs> <laughs> it was hard. But you know what? She kept her vision very, 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 very clear. And I think that is so impressive for me of a young filmmaker to not get thrown by all of the obstacles and to keep her focus on the work, not even to cuss anybody out. 
she just kept going back to her intention, which I'm so inspired and impressed by that. And it, it just means a lot. And you see it on screen. You see something that I've never seen before mm -hmm. on screen. Uh, you know, so I, I, I'm very, very happy with all that suffering that we went through. <laughs> <laughs> Lynn, can you talk about what your experiences have been as an actress prior, like in today's, I guess, content creation climate? Because, um, you know, everyone's always talking all this buzz about black content creators having more diversity in their stories. Do you feel like that's the case from like when you started out? But yeah, I do feel there's, there's more diversity. I mean, uh, Eve's Bayou stands out because it was a look at, an, at, a, at a black family that, that, that we hadn't seen before with a complex undertone that we really didn't know anything about. And now you've, you know, you have, you know, Insecure and you've got you know, Coco America, America Coco, right. and you've got things starting on internet. There's so many places for film to, for, for stories to be told these days. I mean, who knew Hulu would win an Emmy? You know what I mean? For anything. And so it's very exciting, mm -hmm. the diversity of stories that we have, and we have straight ahead commercial success with Shonda Rhimes and... And, you know, so many people doing things. So, yes, it has changed drastically, but it, it's one of the reasons that I love working with young filmmakers and new filmmakers because, you know, that's where the fresh ideas are, you know? And um, we're, we're in a good space. It's just very difficult as we were sitting over lunch to figure out, like, how you sell all of this great art. You know, how long was Awkward Black Girl, which my daughter here, sitting here, Grace, uh, introduced Hi. me to, <laughs> like said, like, Mom, you really just need to just get a camera and just pick it up and just do something, do something. And it's like, Grace, I heard you! Because, <laughs> you know, it's like, I, that's a young thing to really just go in and do it, you know? But yes, there's so many places to tell stories now. It's exciting. I think we're in an exciting place. It but takes the courage yes. of the storytellers to not repeat ourselves, right. but to tell new stories. To take risks. To take risks. Like you did. Like I mean, we both did. I mean, like, it kind of was dawning on me today, because I've just been making the film for four years, yeah. that I was like, oh my God, Lynn really didn't know me from Jack. Neither did Glynn. And, like, or we're any taking of those risks. young actors who really, really needed you really a lot, yeah. you know, because you had to really guide them. But yeah. you took the risk and you thought your story was important enough to do. But that is what makes the, that's what makes the variety of stories. Yeah. And because I, I do feel that we as black people sometimes can repeat ourselves when or, we're or not called scared. upon to do it. Yeah, we're scared to like take a I don't look. know yeah. if it's scared or just limited in, in our consciousness to, or, you know, have seen things that we repeat, you know, it's easy mm. to hum a, mini, uh, a melody you've heard before. Right. Um, <clears throat> but to do something that it, it still requires that courage of the filmmaker mm. to get that done. So you can have as many outlets as you want if people aren't going to be courageous and take another point of view through the prism of our lives. We just might end up looking at the same thing over and over again. Well, thank you for adding variety to the catalog of black film, mm -hmm. independent film out here. And can you tell us a little bit about what's next for you or sure, sure. You know, what you see your career, where you see your career going? I mean, I could make up lots of awesome stuff about where I want my career to go. I, uh, speak, it to anything, <laughs> speak it into existence in front of us. Why not? I'm, I'm, developing, <laughs> I'm developing a fantasy uh, story okay. about a fairy that comes to the human world, a post-apocalyptic oh. human world. And then I'm also um, working on... Um, like a short art film that infuses fantasy and a collective witnessing of black women's mourning. Um, and then I also want to do a documentary about dance in Jamaica, which is where I'm from. So there's Ooh. a lot of things that I'm nice. interested in doing uh, and hope that I get the chance to do. Okay. Yeah. Well, where can people find you, follow you? My name touch? is super, it's Chico. I'm at Chico on all the socials and Solace Film on all the socials. And you guys follow us so that you can know what we're up to. Thank and you. And we're going to have a party later on tonight, 7 to 9 at Ace. Okay. Yeah, with Afro Beats. Ace Hotel. Or yeah, I would cool love place. questions if we have time. Oh, yes. Cute. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely.
Thank you for asking me about craft. Yes. Um, so the sound was super, super, super important to me. It took me a year till I a, could raise the money and find the right person. For me, I wanted the film to be an immersive experience for the audience. I wanted people, I wanted as much as possible to try and approximate what it felt like to be inside of a body that was, you know, a person that had an eating disorder. And so um, Nathan, uh, who's the sound designer, he did a movie called Searching with John Cho. We spent a lot of time collecting, so like for example, I call them the meta sections. It's where my body is wrapped in plastic. That became, um, like we had a soundscape for that in particular, and then we had a soundscape for when Soul would start to binge or when her anxiety would pop up. And for me, you know, the, the way that I would talk to the sound designer is that food, there's an arc in, there's an arc in the food addiction, or there's an arc in the, yeah, in the eating disorder. Like sometimes it slows life down at a molasses-like quality. And so that's when you'd hear the music kind of go like more drony. And then sometimes like when she was restricting and she was on the, on the diet pills, which are like speed, then we wanted the music to like have a different, or, or the sound rather, to have a different quality. So we really went through the entire film and sort of spotted all the areas in which Soul, the main character, was having anxiety around food or around control. And then we like uh, spotted all the parts where I was in the film. And then eventually towards the end of the film, the two married. And Michelle and Degiocello, who did the score for the film, uh, was a very special thing for me because I've been a fan of her since I was 15. And I did the same thing with Michelle. We sat and we watched the film. And then I kind of let her go off and do stuff because I trusted. We've known each other uh, I'm 40 now. I've known it since I was 25. And so, you know, I let her go off and do her thing. And then I would give notes on some of the, the, the music. But she really kind of understood that emotional landscape that I was dealing with. Thanks for asking that. Okay. So we're also going to have the other filmmaker from the first project come up. I'm sorry. I Come on up. <laughs> uh, thank you. Um, I, I would love to hear from both of you guys. Um, can you tell us about your production schedules and how long it took to shoot both projects? Um, so I've been, uh, so I've been writing my script over the summer, and so it took just uh, several months to sort of get all the pre-pro together. The casting for my film was the most difficult part, so that actually made the process take a lot longer. But I was able to shoot my film in just about three days. Congratulations. Yeah. Thank you. It's a feat to finish anything. So yeah, congrats. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. You know, it's, it's great to hear about your story because we did have our own experiences on a much smaller scale, but I think I appreciate someone who can keep an even keel during their process. Lynn's being really nice to me. I don't know how even keel I was. For the actors, I was. My yeah. team, not so much. I know. Well, you know, they, they can have their own stories. The kids, the kids I work with, they love me. So, you know, it's all good. <laughs> yeah, no, that was my saving grace. I was like, all my actors appreciate me, and that's, that's my job is mostly to make sure they're happy. Um, so for me... And your crew appreciate you. Your some DP, of them. Yeah. Well, my the DP. ones that didn't, who cares? <laughs> it's, you, you got it done, and it looks good, right? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, no, my cinematographer, Bruce Francis Cole, you guys have probably heard of Jin, the film yes, that I Yes, I love that movie. That was awesome. Yeah, Bruce shot Jin. He shot my film. He's an amazing nice. person. He's my brother, not really, but my brother in that sense. Um, yeah, him, the production designer, the costume designer, the sort of head creative people, like we all worked really well together. So I shot my, I, I kick-started my film in 2014. I shot it in 2015, 20 days. Um, nice. And then I ran out of money. Then I did an Indiegogo campaign the end of 2015. Got some money from one of the executive producers, Chelsea Peretti. Edited for a month, ran out of money. That kind of went on until 2017 last year when um, I did a fundraiser. Roxane Gay did a fundraiser. Do you guys know Roxane Gay who wrote Hunger? She's amazing. It's a, it's I've a, heard of her yeah. name. So yeah. Hunger is the first book that I read that dealt with anything to do with body trauma, fatness, like, you know, any of that stuff. And so Roxanne did a fundraiser for me and that kind of galvanic, you know, like sort of summed up, like whatever, energy got like drummed up and Morgan's Mark came in and helped me get to Picture Lock and they are, 
Morgan's Mark is Tina Mabry, who did Mississippi Damned, and she directed Queen Sugar, and she was one of the writers uncredited for uh, The Hate You Give. Like, there are two black queer women who run a company in Hollywood, and they gave me money to finish, and then um, I'm, like, trailing off. Anyway, then I got a grant to Color Time, then I ran out of money, wow. and then a month and a half before I premiered, I did a GoFundMe, and that's how I was able to pay for my sound design and composing and, and that stuff. Ladies and gentlemen, nice. it was a long time. Nice. Yeah. Respect her so much. Okay, so we have time for like one or two questions because you have to wrap up soon. Does anyone else want to ask anything? Which filmmaker? Oh, okay. Sure. So uh, the question was, how did I navigate uh, directing a young actor in something that was such a personal story for me? Um, I did. So Hope, who's a main actress, she was in the short film. So we've actually had many years to get to know each other. I did rehearsals with them. Um, and I... It's just part of being a director. It's like you've got to situate your actors uh, and direct them, you know, for every scene, adjust them for every scene. Um, the scene, the last scene in the film, or towards the last scene where she's eating out of the garbage, that's not my personal, like I didn't do that in my disease, but that was one of the scenes where I remember I had to run to the bathroom because her performance kind of pulled me all the way back to when I was in sort of the height of my disease because she wow. did such a great job. Um, yeah. Hmm. Find good actors, and then if you're a good director, you get the good Yeah, but she really took care of her young actors. I mean, she really, because some of it was emotional, some of it took courage on their part, and she, I mean, I wasn't there when those she, scenes were shot, but you were very thoughtful mm -hmm. in how you handled them and gave them a safety net, you know, to venture into those spaces. Yeah. I mean, she yeah. did do that. That's she one of the things I learned. The for that, <laughs> I, I learned that from George C. Wolf, who told me that the, you know, the director's job is really to go on set and to like, this is how I interpret it, almost like a mother. Like I'm there to make sure that all the actors feel safe enough to, to take risks, to fail, and know that part of failing is discovery. And that's, you know, that's how I approach directing and working with actors. And I find it a lot of fun and very challenging in like a really beautiful, exciting way. Thanks. Um. Um, so for my film, you know, I was uh, dedicated to scouring Maryland to find local talent. I'm a filmmaker from Baltimore. So oh. uh, yeah, it, it took me to a uh, performing arts high school where I met the lead uh, actor of my film. And you know, it was funny because he, I had done a pitch to the whole class, they invited me to come. And he did seem sort of the least interested, but sort of his quiet, reserved demeanor, I was sort of drawn to him as a personality. And he had never done a short film before, although he had done some plays, you know, this was sort of his first thing. And we had a lot of chaos, losing an actor the day before. So I really relied on the openness of these teenage boys sort of tackling a story that I feel in my generation they wouldn't have done. So uh, we really, I really relied on their their improbability a bit. I definitely gave them guidelines and everything, but you know they really saw what was going on and sort of lent some of their own experiences to that. The, the last scene where they're lying in bed together, that was uh, pretty much choreographed by the two actors. You know, I sort of told them what I needed, and I said, you know, what are you comfortable with? You know, what what can we do, and and how do you really perceive this? And so that's what we came up with. Nice. Nice. All right, last question. So in my film, we got a, a grant from Panavision. So we used REDS, but then we also used the Sony, I think it's Sony F7. I'm really bad with cameras. The one that's like, which one? A7? Someone said? I think it's like A7 or F1. Yeah, that one. The one that's like handles low light. So the scene where um, in the beginning of the film where Jasmine is like dancing on the glass, like that was all shot with practicals. Like we just use the street lamps and we use that camera that is really good at capturing low light. 
and then there's some parts that are uh, that's iPhone footage because I was very int I'm interested in texture as a parallel to the emotional texture of the characters and so intentionally we use a lot of you know a lot of different cameras. The artwork in the scenes. Oh, she's so uh, Emily. This is like. <laughs> it's a good story. Emily, so my production designer, Kendra, is a, was a USC student, and she brought in her friend Emily. And I remember when I first met Emily, I was like, I'm going to have a white girl making artwork that is like representing a, like a young black woman. But Emily turned out to be like one of my most favorite people. And after we finished shooting, I understood why. Like she loves art and like knows Carrie James Marshall. She knows... Uh, Wangechi, is it Wangechi Mutu? Like she knows, uh, she, like that is her visual language that she was able to draw from and she, she did the sketchbook and then her and her friends did the collages and then sometimes I had the actors also do the collages, make the collages as like a bonding exercise when we were rehearsing. All right, cool. Well, thank you so much for attending Thanks, this guys. screening. Thank you to both filmmakers. Congratulations. You. Wish you the best. And thank you, Lynn. I hope you don't hate me, but <laughs> I'm just messing. <laughs> Um, but yes, um, please make sure that you attend the reception. It's going to be at the VIP lounge in the Advocate Center. Um, and please exit this way as well. So thank you again for coming and thank you. Thanks for listening to the Black Film Space podcast. If you're interested in being part of our community and attending events, please visit us at blackfilmspace.com and follow us on Facebook and Instagram at Black Film Space. Subscribe to our email list and podcast. All right, thanks. See you soon.